Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my public PhD event. The title of my thesis is Hardware Supported Software and Control Flow Integrity. I'm going to start off this presentation by saying that devices permeate our everyday lives. We rely on a huge number of different devices to provide some different functionalities in our lives. We use smart watches, we use cars with 100 or more microprocessors inside, we use smartphones, smart cards, pacemakers, and so forth. And it's important, well, and, but however there are individuals and organizations in the world <laughs> that, want <to> make, <laughs> that want to make our devices misbehave. And it's important that our devices should behave as expected. So, misbehaving devices, can cause problems. And what kind of problems can these devices cause? Or these misbehaving devices cause? It can have problems with safety, so your car's brakes can be disabled by an attacker, a placemaker can be disabled, critical infrastructure could crash, it can also have privacy implications, your devices can spy on, 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 on the user's mouth, it can, take, can spy on the camera, the pictures that the device takes, uh, microphone, browser history, and so forth. Furthermore, it can have financial implications since your device can steal, the device can steal your credit card information. Further, it can have implications on your computing power because misbehaving, misbehaving devices can steal computing power by mining cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. How, how does this work? How, how is it possible that attackers can, can make our devices misbehave? So, our devices make use of hardware and software components that have flaws or bugs inside them. We refer to these flaws or bugs as vulnerabilities. And attackers can exploit these vulnerabilities in order to gain control of the device. So here I show an example of, of a, a vehicle that has been uh, remotely killed while it was driving on the highway with a reporting, reporter inside. This is in 2015, and it led to the recall of 1.4 million vehicles. So how does this attack work? Um, this, this vehicle was uh, connected to uh, the Sprint satellite network, so one of the microcontrollers on the vehicle. This one was a multimedia microcontroller, it was connected to the Sprint satellite network. And uh, an attacker connected by, via his cell phone to the Sprint satellite network, and he could gain control of this microcontroller, and there was no safety or security measures in place. So he was rather trivial to connect to this microcontroller, but he couldn't do much more than change the volume of the, the radio and, and change the radio's channels and so forth. The attacker then realized that this microcontroller is also connected to another microcontroller, this V850, and this V850 is an interesting target because it's connected to the CAN bus, and the CAN bus is a, is a bus that vehicles use to send messages and to, to control the entire vehicle, basically. So the engine is connected to it, the, in, the transmission is connected to it, the of display is connected to it, and so forth. So the attackers then uh, looked at the V850 and my controller's firmware, they extracted it, they reverse engineered it, and they reprogrammed it. And by reprogramming it, they were able to send their own messages onto this CAN bus, and therefore they were able to control all the different components of the car and take complete control of the vehicle. So, one of the vulnerabilities, or one of the most common vulnerabilities inside uh, our devices is due to software bugs. Uh, our, our devices make use of microprocessors, and software runs on each microprocessor. Software is awesome because it makes it very easy to develop new applications. However, it's also very difficult to make software bug-free and make sure that there are no vulnerabilities in our software. One of the solutions is to use security, and uh, to develop a security policy, you need to first look at and determine what kind of attack capabilities you would like to prevent, or what you need to study your attacker and make, you need to see like what these or make some assumptions of these capabilities. After, afterwards, you can design a countermeasure to deter this specific attacker. And countermeasures prevent exploitation. So one of the countermeasures, or the countermeasures that we specifically looked at in this thesis, was to prevent or detect abnormal program behavior. There are also other countermeasures that you can employ, but this is specifically the countermeasure that we used or, or in, in this thesis. 
So we are in an arms race. Attackers and defenders are in an arms race. For each attack, a new countermeasure or a set of countermeasures are deployed or, or published or developed. And after each countermeasure is developed, a new set of attacks are deployed and sometimes published even, followed by it's the same cycle. Always count, more countermeasures and, and, and new attacks are, are uh, developed. So stack smashing attack was published by RF1 in 1996 and a non-executable stack which is a, a hardware software mechanism it's, it's uh, supported by most modern microprocessors and present inside most modern operating systems was first publicly announced in 1997 a return oriented programming attack can circumvent the security of a non-executable stack and this was published in 2005 control for integrity aims to prevent return oriented programming attacks but they are it, it's got some vulnerabilities. It's still vulnerable to non-controlled data attacks. And this list goes on. What I show you in the slides, it's only a small portion of possible attacks and, and countermeasures, but it's just to, to paint you a picture. So stack canaries can circumvent or can ensure that some parts of the of, of a stack smashing attack uh, cannot be executed, but format string attacks can then again circumvent the security of, of, of stack canaries. And, and, the, and, and the list goes on. Um, and there's also some, some modern, or some, some relatively new examples and uh, it's likely that we will continue to stay in an arms race for the foreseeable future because no security mechanism is, is completely fail safe and uh, there are many, many attackers in the world and they are trying to break the security of our systems. Let's look at some attacker capabilities and, uh, and, and countermeasures. So, there are many different attack capabilities that you could assume. And you could assume that your attacker could be in full control of data memory, you could be in full control of program memory, you could uh, launch fault attacks on control flow, you could be able to do side channel attacks, you could launch invasive attacks on our integrated circuits. And countermeasures you can employ or deploy on many different uh, layers of abstraction. So, for instance, you can have countermeasures inside your user program. You can have countermeasures inside your operating system, in the hypervisor level, inside the processor or the hardware level, or on the transistor level. And in this thesis, we mostly assume attackers that are capable of performing, uh, being in control of the data, as well as the, the code or the program memory, as well as attackers that can mount attacks on, on, on using fault, faults on the control flow. Furthermore, we work on the, the we develop our countermeasures inside the processor or the, the hardware level. So, as I said, we develop countermeasures in this thesis enforced by the processor and the goal is to ensure that software does not misbehave. We have two uh, major contributions in this thesis. The first contribution is to analyze existing hardware-based security policies and the second contribution is to develop, to develop new security processors enforced by our processors. And we also, for the, the, the architectures developed, in this thesis, we evaluate them on a field programmable gate array, which allows us to provide fairly accurate estimates on the, the cost of the hardware and the, the performance overhead of our architectures. Security in hardware, what does this mean? So, here I provide an example of a, of a processor, so like four pipeline stages of a processor, and this hardware monitor component. This hardware monitor component was a was a, a component which we added to the processor. And this hardware monitor connects to one of the pipeline stages of this processor. So this hardware monitor was not existing in, in the original processor. We added it to in order to provide security to the system. And the idea is for this hardware monitor to to monitor this pipeline stage in order to detect abnormal program behavior. So, security in hardware is, is great because it can provide strong protection against many different attacks. It also allows you to have a small trusted computing base. The trusted computing base is the, the set of components that are critical for security for the, for the system. So, it's important to have a small trusted computing base because it's, it's uh, easier to verify. If you have a small trusted computing base, it's easier to verify the correctness of the components. And uh, it's important to verify the correctness, otherwise your security might not be as good as you would think. Also, uh, we, did, 
when you design a hardware security, you can be independent of the operating system as well as other software. So, here I provide an outline of the rest of the talk. So, first I will provide some background. Afterwards, I will present our analysis of hardware based uh, control flow integrity. After that, I'll present Sophia, which is a new architecture developed in this thesis, which enforces software as well as control flow integrity. And finally, I'll present SEM, which is a lightweight software integrity architecture. So, first, some definitions. We define control flow as the order of executed instructions in a program. All programs consist of instructions, and the instructions um, tell the microprocessor what to do. So the, the order in which the instructions execute inside a program is we define as control flow. And a control flow graph is a model of the valid control flow inside a program. So if you look at all the possible paths inside a program, then the control flow graph will represent the, 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 the control flow of the, the entire, the, the valid control flow entire, inside the entire program. And here I provide an example of a, a control flow graph for an each then hour statement. So each node represents uh, instructions, each edge represents control flow. And in this case, this first node, here you will have a comparison because it's if then else, right? So the first, the if you do the, 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 the comparison, if this comparison is true, then the one path is taken through the control flow graph. However, if the comparison here is false, then the, the other path will be taken through this control flow graph. And, uh, here we assume that a uh, jump instruction is, uh, is, is uh, used for doing this, uh, uh, causing these edges or this, this control flow through this, uh, these nodes. Another example, a function call. So here we have this node 1.1. It, uh, it uses a call instruction to call this node number 2. At the end of node number 2, there's a return instruction, and the return instruction calls this node number 1.2. To be executed. So this just gives you the semantics of a normal call and return. So when you call a, a, a function. So we define forward edges as edges which occur due to calls and jumps, so two specific types of instructions that alter the control flow. And we define backward edges as uh, edges which occur due to returns. So control flow integrity, this, this, the goal of control, control flow integrity is to prevent the hijacking of control flow. The idea is that you restrict the control flow to the control flow graph. And as we said earlier, control flow graph is a model of all the valid control flow inside your program. This provides a powerful and generic attack detection mechanism since many attacks require abnormal control flow. We define static CFI. So static CFI is when you restrict the control flow along the control flow graph. The idea is that you first generate the control flow graph from using static analysis method, methods of, from either your source code or from a compiled program binding. Then at runtime, you check the validity of each branch by verifying that it's allowed by the control flow graph. However, it's important to note that the security of static CFI depends on the accuracy of the control flow graph. And static analysis is sometimes imprecise for some types of programs. So programs which contains function pointers or virtual C++ methods, these sort of programs are difficult to analyze the static analysis tools, and then the, the tools often resort to over approximation where more edges are added to the control flow graph than what is strictly necessary. There's another pro problem with static CFI, and that is the stateless problem. Um, static CFI cannot ensure that function returns to the most recent caller. And I will demonstrate this problem to you using this control flow graph. Here I show you the same semantics with call and return. Uh, but now we can assume that this node number three, this could be a printf, right? So printf can be used from many different places inside your program. But in our example, let's say it's used by two different locations, so two different nodes um, can call printf. And what we would expect is that, that if node 1.1 calls printf, then it should return always only to 1.2. And if node 2.1 calls this printf, then the return edge, the backward edge should only go to node 2.2. However, 
if an attacker can launch a runtime attack and tamper with the return address while executing the code inside this uh, printf over here, then you could bend the control flow to go from node 1.1, 2, 3, and then 2.2. And this is clearly not the control flow path that we would expect the program to follow. However, it would still respect the control flow graph because our control flow graph is static and it just it's, it's happy as long as these edges are just uh, follow the uh, um, uh, as, as, as shown here. So the problem is that the runtime state is not considered when determining the valid control flow paths. And the solution to this that many uh, CFI policies use is they use a static CFI policy together with a shadow call stack. And the idea of a shadow call stack is to store a copy of the return address on the shadow stack. So for each call, a copy of the return address is placed in the shadow stack, and for each return, the, the, the copy of the return address on the shadow stack is compared to the main, address, the main stack, and if these two match, then everything is assumed to be fine, however, if they do not match, then the alarm is raised. So next, I'll present our analysis of hardware-based control flow integrity. Um, and here we addressed the recent problem. We, we, we found that it was difficult to determine the exact security and usability of existing CFI architectures. So our contribution is a systematic analysis of 21 hardware-based CFI architectures. Um, as part of this analysis, we, we selected a number of different evaluation properties, and we used these evaluation properties to compare the different architectures in terms of the security that they provide, the, the overhead that they have, as well as their, their usability. And this table summarizes the, the findings of this study. Uh, in this column, we have all the different architectures, all the different names, and sometimes the names are given, so we just gave the, the author names. Uh, in this policies, uh, these two columns represent the, the type of policies used. So the stateful policy, this is your backward edge policy, so we can see ACS. This is the shadow call stack that is used by many different architectures. The static policy, your forward edge policy, this is used by the, what, the 12 different policies used by these uh, different architectures in total. Further, there's also a different set of attacker capabilities that are assumed by these architectures. So, uh, this D represents a, an attacker that is capable of modifying data at runtime, C represents an attacker that is capable of modifying code and programs. Uh, memory at, at runtime, and the F represents the attacker that can control, control flow at runtime. So all the, all architectures assume an attacker that can mo uh, modify data. Some architectures also additionally have uh, assume an attacker that can modify code, and even fewer assume all three: code, data, and faults on, on control flow. Um, so some architectures employ a software integrity mechanism, which ensures at runtime that the, that the program memory uh, or the executed program is not it's unaltered. Um, and we have this fine grain column, this is the sort of uh, high security column, so this, this indicates whether an architecture uh, enforces uh, only the edges which are inside a control flow graph. Um, also, the CFG column, this represents whether an architecture requires the control flow graph in order to enforce its policy. So we found that most architectures which are not fine-grained do not rely on a control flow graph. Uh, in addition, our own architecture, or an architecture developed in this thesis, Sophia, uh, is, is listed over here, and we will uh, present the Sophia architecture in the next couple of slides. So, our main findings in this study um, was that backward edge protection is pretty much solved using a shadow call stack. Shadow call stacks have been used for being used for a long time and many different architectures rely upon a shadow call stack. Forward edge protection is not as easily solved. It's only partial, or we argue that it's only partially solved. Um, you can classify forward edge uh, policy uh, protection in, in either high security or low security. High security is the fine grained architectures. Um, we argue that it's impractical for some programs because it's difficult to to analyze these programs with uh, control flow that is difficult to analyze, uh, so it's difficult to build the control flow graphs for these types of programs. Uh, low security CFI is practical, 
because they don't rely on uh, control flow graphs. However, they provide limited protection since they cannot detect all legal branches. And they also suffer from the problem that if an attacker knows the exact policy employed by these architectures, that you can craft an attack to certain the security of, of these architectures. Next, I'll present Sophia. Sophia is a software and control flow integrity architecture. The third model used by Sophia is we assume that the attacker can control program and data memory, the attacker can fault control flow, he can attack cryptographic protocols. We, don't, we assume no side channel attacks, we assume no invasive attacks, and we assume that the data cannot break cryptographic primitives. Here I show a block diagram of a processor with two components added. Uh, one is a CFI component, and the CFI component is, is uh, responsible for decrypting instructions at runtime using dynamic control flow. And at the same time, we also have this SI component. This is a, the software integrity component, and it's, it's uh, used to, to verify the correctness of the encrypted instructions. So the idea with Sophia is that uh, encrypted instructions are stored inside program memory, and then these instructions are fetched, and this CFI component in decrypts the instructions, sends it to the instruction decode stage, and then the software integrity component ensures that the decrypted instructions were cleanly decrypted correctly. Sophia prevents tampering of instructions as well as control flow, and Sophia is also security critical since it never allows instructions to execute, which were tap never allows tampered instructions or instructions which are result, uh, the result of, of tampered control flow to execute. So uh, Sophia uses counter mode encryption, like I said before, uh, it decrypts instructions using the dynamic control flow information of, of the program. So, counter mode encryption, or in counter mode encryption, a counter is fed to a block cipher as an input, and this block cipher then, um, the output of this block cipher is, is XORed with the cipher text. In our case, the cipher text is, is instructions which are stored in program memory. Um, the, our counters consist of uh, nonce, which is unique between program versions and uh, different programs. And then the control flow dependent information, we re represent this using the previous program counter and the current program, program counter. And the program counter, this points to the current executing instruction. So if you use the, the previous program counter as well as the current program counter, this is the most fine-grained grain energy in which you can represent control flow. So, for each instruction, this block cipher operation is used, and the output of the block cipher operation is then um, used to decrypt the instructions uh, at one time. So, Sophia relies on keys that are unique per device and that are embedded inside the silicon. Um, and the assumption is that uh, the keys are, well, the key can only be accessed by hardware. And the assumption is that only the, the, the software provider or the, the person that does the transformations on the, on the software uh, has access to this key. Here I show an example. Um, we have a small program, five instructions, uh, with the address of the instruction listed on the left. Um, uh, instruction number two, if you to, to decrypt this instruction, this counter is used. So the previous program counter is one. So one is, this, is the previous address, and uh, each one of these nodes represents an instruction, right? So um, the flow from one to two is present inside this counter. And this counter will then be used to first encrypt this instruction and then at runtime decrypt it. Similarly, counter number five, which has got the, the control flow between two address two and five, uh, this counter number five is used to, to decrypt instruction number five at runtime. However, if an attacker manages to make the control flow flow from 1 to 5, then a different counter value will be used, and this will cause a decryption error. Because yeah, it's a different counter, right? So, an invalid decryption, there's still a problem with this. If you send a, an instruction resulting from an invalid decryption to the processor, then this instruction might still execute, because this opcode might still be valid. We don't know this. so. We need to have something extra, that's where the software integrity component comes in, and we will discuss that in the next couple of slides. 
This is first summarized. The CFI component, uh, countermeasure, when it's used by itself, it can prevent some attacks that hijack control flow. It provides copyright protection because each device uses a unique key. So if you encrypt the software that can be used for the one Sophia processor, you cannot copy this software onto another Sophia processor and execute it there. Furthermore, it provides code secrecy, also reverse engineering protection, because we assume an attacker that has not got access to the keys used by our Sophia processor. However, we still have the problem that illegal instructions can execute. And that we solve with this software integrity component. And the goal of the software integrity component is to prevent the execution of tampered instructions. So uh, we, we rely on a message authentication code for this. And a uh, message authentication code is, is calculated over groups of n instructions. And this message authentication code, this tag, is stored interleaved with the, the instructions. Um, so then at runtime, as the instructions are fetched from uh, main memory, these instructions are sent to a Mac component, a hardware Mac component, and uh, this runtime Mac then is compared to the stored Mac, and if these, the runtime of the stored Mac does not match, then the attack is assumed and then the processor, processor is reset. So, to summarize, uh, here we show the CFI, the, the properties that the CFI hardware feature gives, the software integrity hardware feature, and the combination. And these two, two components are used in combination. So the software integrity component provides software integrity and tampered code protection. The CFI uh, hardware feature provides control flow integrity and code secrecy. But when the CFI and software integrity components are used together, it can guarantee that tampered control flow or instructions resulting from tampered control flow will not execute. The most significant hardware overhead of Sophia is a 23% reduction in the clock speed, and this is due to a, a low latency block cycle being placed inside the critical, inside the pipeline status of the processor. And this block cycle is in the critical path, so it's the, the component that takes the is the most complicated component. Um, and furthermore, the, the CPL architecture has an average execution time overhead of 137%. Next, we will present SEM. Well, I will present SEM, which is a, a lightweight software integrity architecture. Uh, the threat model used by SEM is we assume that the, the attacker can tamper with code before it's installed. We assume that attack controls all addressable off chip memory. We assume the attacker can fault off chip memory, however, no physical attacks can be done on the system on chip. And uh, the attacker can perform protocol level attacks, but he cannot break, break strong cryptographic primitives. So, the goal of the software integrity architecture is to protect the integrity of code and read only data. Um, previous uh, works, which did similar or which developed similar architectures, uh, Modified IP or you rely upon non standard interfaces. And when you modify IPs as, such as a uh, processor or a memory controller, then it's, it's inflexible because with the next processor that you want to add this architecture, this, this, this mechanism onto, you need to go and port your uh, architecture. It's also expensive to modify processors because or, or other IP because you need to get hold of the source code of these processors and, or, or IP and uh, you need to buy this from the semiconductor manufacturers. Um, so our, our approach to, uh, relies on a standalone IP core and for this we, we plug our IP core directly into, into the bus of a, of a processor using standard interfaces. So this Picture shows uh, this figure shows how this SEM component connects to uh, the processor. So we place the, the SEM component has got a, its own memory region assigned to it. So when the processor fetches instructions from this component, then what the SEM component does is it fetches max and the instructions from untrusted memory. So the assumption here. That the program uh, and Max are already inside here. 
So the matching instruction are fetched from untrusted memory. The SCM component computes a runtime MAC and the stored MAC is compared to the runtime MAC. And if the MAC verification process succeeds, then the instructions are, are sent to the processor, uh, the caches of the processor. At the same time, so remember I said there's a memory region assigned to this component, but at the same time the processor can still perform these unprotected accesses. So you can see the arrows point in both directions, so the, 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 the processor can still read and write to any untrusted memory region. And this is also the way in which the, um, the program is loaded. So the, the transform program, the program containing the maximum instructions, are loaded onto untrusted memory. And you can see the arrows only point to the left here. So this component is, is read only, so you can only read um, instructions through this component. So this component provides plug and play security because the, we use the read lock. in the hardware side we rely on an IP core that plugs into the bus of the processor using standard interfaces. This component can be reused between different processors. Also, the software is compatible with an existing tool chain and it's, it's not terribly complicated to, to or it's, it's quite simple to do the, the software transformation process. Here I show a memory map, so if uh, when executing instructions through the SCA memory region, the processor sees a contiguous memory space, so the maps are transparent to the processor. The processor does not see, see these maps. Um, however, uh, on the untrusted memory side, here the maps are stored interleaved with the instructions. So this component provides protection against code rejection and code tampering. Um, uh, it provides defenses against fault attacks on external memory and it's independent of the operating system. Okay, some hardware area overhead and our execution time overhead is less than 2%. But I may ask, does this cheat attack work still if we, if we use our Sophia core or our ACM core uh, on this V850 microphone? So the, the attacker had to uh, so in, 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 uh, the attacker had to like download the V850 uh, firmware and he had to, uh, they spent a, a lot of time reverse engineering this firmware um, and when they could re reverse engineer it they had to write their own program and then load it onto onto this V850 microprocessor. So if um, SEM was present here, then it wouldn't have been as easy um, because they, they, the attacker wouldn't have been able to, to uh, wouldn't have accessed the key, so wouldn't be able to to um, compute the max over over the groups of instructions. So it would not work. Um, furthermore, if Sophia was present in this call, um, the attacker would have not, not have been able to 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 uh, see the, the the source code because the source code is encrypted with the key that's unique um, to the Sophia call. Furthermore. Um, executing the instructions will not um, have been possible because he wouldn't have been able to update the source code himself because he hasn't access to the keys. So, uh, for future work, there's a need for new hardware based or CFI policies that are high security and are practical for all, all types of programs. Furthermore, there's a need for CFI policies that are, uh, that can, that are unaffected by non controlled data attacks. Um, the architectures that were developed in, in this work are not, do not uh, provide side channel protection, so there's a need for continuing this type of research, but also taking side channels into consideration. Also, key management is it's, uh, uh, there's a need for, for uh, developing key management policies um, for architectures like the ones developed in this thesis. Um, this in this thesis we relied heavily upon low latency block ciphers and. Uh, in the past, there hasn't been a lot of research on low latency ciphers. So there's also a need for continuing research on low latency ciphers, which will inspire the next generation of hardware-based um, security architectures. So to conclude, Sophia provides strong protection against a large number of different attacks. And ACM is a lightweight alternative to Sophia with a reduced functionality. Thank you for your attention.